All right, Shabbat Shalom, family. Give me that background and bring my mic down just a slight touch. It is a blessing to be here with all of you. It's a packed house tonight. Y'all must have thought something special was happening. It is something special happening. It's Sabbath day. We out here. <laughs> we here. It's the Sabbath. Amen. So welcome, everybody. Let's get right into Thapala Shal Yahawashai, the prayer of Yahawashai. Let's go. Abanawa Shaba Shamayam Kodash Haya Shamka Yahawa Malakwathka Thaba Ratazaka Haya Aisha Baaratiza Kowa Haya Bashamayam Natan Lanawa Lakam Kal Yawam Wasalaknawa Kawabwathnawa Kasalaknawa Kawabwath Yanawa Walaa Thaba Yahanawa Banasawan Abal Hawashainawa Mayan Rai Kaya Laka Hamalakwath Waha Allah Waha Apa Arath Lawamyam Aman Hallelujah. Let's translate that into English. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, real quick, special thanks. Let me see. Special thanks. It's a, you guys know we're supposed to give thanks for all things. So I'm grateful that you guys are here. We had a wonderful Sabbath uh after the Sabbath, we usually all get together as a family. So our sister Kim had us over at her house and we had a blessed time. The children were swimming and we had all kinds of food. So tonight we are going to be at my house. Um, make sure you speak with a member here to get the address. We're going to be there when the sun goes down. What is the food theme for tonight? What is it? It's childhood, our, our childhood favorite. So make sure you're bringing that. We're not going to start cooking until the sun goes down, but that's at my house later tonight. One of the things that uh, you guys know, when they find us online, when people find us online, most people will say, I joined this group because of the teachings. Okay. They come because of the teachings, but they stay because of the family. They stay because of the love that you guys give because we are a big family here. Amen. Uh, let me see. Special thanks to Monty. He is always holding it down. You guys don't know, but uh, he's here at the church almost every single day, vacuuming, setting up tables, all of that. So we uh, we appreciate all of your labor, Monty. Special thanks to Pastor Greg. Uh, he's he's um, always here. He's now working part time here at the church. So we are getting a lot more done. So the people that I think I want you to continue to keep them in their prayers, in your prayers, because the scripture says that we're not supposed to grow weary in well doing. And that's part of the reason why we give thanks to these people for all the things that they do so that they know that they are appreciated. Amen. All right, let's get into the paleo Hebrew. Well, show them what we're talking about. This is the final message. Now, this is not part 12 because we started with an introduction to the song of Moses. And then we did 11 parts. We broke down every single verse in the song of Moses, precept upon precept. And now we, now that we've seen all the trees, we're going to step back and look at the forest. So there's not going to be a lot of precepts. We're going to read the song of Moses again, but I'm going to give you a summary of each, each section so that you can see that the Most High knew the end from the beginning. Amen? This word beginning, show them the Paleo-Hebrew word for today. Bring the beat down in the house just a touch. This is the word beginning. That's a big word, ain't it? Okay, ancient Hebrew was very easy to pronounce because there's only A's and an I. And you break the word into syllables based on where the vowel is. ra a sha yath how I say it? ra a sha yath That's how you say beginning. It's a picture of a man's head, and then there's an ox head, and then there's a picture of teeth, and then it's a picture of an arm stretched out with a hand, and then it's a picture of an X 
or what might someone might say is a cross. Okay. Usually that is referred to as a paleo cross. It's not straight up and down. It's slightly to the side. Okay. Go ahead and show them the meaning of each of these letters. Now in ancient Hebrew, every character has a meaning. So this Ra is a picture of a head. It's a person. It means the head, the highest or first. The second one is a picture of an ox. It's an ox head. It means strength, leader, authority, first or head. The Shah is a picture of teeth. It means to consume. It means destroy. Are you guys understanding this? Because I teach this every week. I want to make sure that you guys are grasping the idea. The Paleo Hebrew is so easy to understand. When I see those teeth, what do I think of? I think of consuming. Okay. And if I had me like a piece of chicken and I put it up to my teeth, I'm, I'm going to destroy that chicken. Right? So it means destroy, but it also means to enter because it would enter in through your teeth. Okay. The arm and the hand, I use my arm and my hand to work or to make something. It's a mighty hand. It means power. Does that make sense? The last one is a seal. It's a covenant. It's a sign. Like where do you sign your name? On X marks the spot. Exactly. Okay. So what do you guys think that this word Ra'ashayath ra means using those? Pick one word from each column and we're going to make it into a sentence so that we can reveal the meaning of this word. Anybody want to give it a shot? I know this is a big word. Where we at? Who got it? Who got something? Man, y'all real quiet over there. Now everybody want to talk all at the same time. I can't understand. Go ahead. That, that's pretty good. That's a good start. He's like, he wants to use a lifeline. Somebody help him out. The highest authority what? Okay. So here's the interesting thing. All the answers are correct. You're trying to make a coherent sentence out of it. Show them the letters that I selected real quick. The highest authority consume to make and covenant now if i put that into a sentence the beginning remember he knew the end from the beginning this is what that means go ahead the highest authority will consume and make a covenant you see that what will he consume you consume is also enter the highest authority will enter and make a covenant. That's what he did from the very beginning. You guys uh, know the first line of the Bible tells you the entire testimony of what's going to happen. In the beginning, when you read it in Hebrew, it tells you he's going to come and he's going to make a covenant with us. Amen. All right. Let me show you about the end from the beginning. Isaiah chapter 46 and give me verse eight. The scripture says, remember this and shew yourselves men. Bring it again to mind. What does remember mean? It means to bring it again to mind. Why is he telling you to remember? Because he knows what you are. What does it say? Oh, ye transgressors. What's a transgressor? Sinner. A sinner. A somebody who breaks the law. So what is he telling you to remember? He says, remember the law and show yourselves to be men. What kind of men? Men of Yah. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Give me verse 9. He says, remember the former things of old, for I am Yah, and there is none else. I am Yah, and there is none like me. Amen. Now watch this very next verse. This is what he is able to do, and no one else is able to do this. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. When he wrote the first line of the Bible, he already knew what was going to be written in Revelation chapter 22. He already knew the end when he wrote the first line. That's what it means. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So has he said it and he's not going to do it? Yah forbid. If he said it, he's going to do it. And that's what we find out when we're reading the Song of Moses. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, but the Song of Moses is the song that we sing once we are translated and we are going into the kingdom to celebrate all of the feasts. As we pass through the gates over the sea of glass, we have harps in our hands and we stand there on the sea of glass and we sing two songs according to the scriptures. What's the first song? 
Song of Moses. That's why we have spent the last 12 weeks learning every line of this song. And what's the other song? The Song of the Lamb. The Song of the Lamb, all of the lyrics are written there in Revelation. Okay, we'll probably get a chance to go over that next. But right now, let's get in and summarize all of these verses from the Song of Moses. Now, we've covered every single one of them. All this is going to do, I'm going to do now what I was commanded to do when we read Isaiah. Take me back to verse 8 so that you can see what we are doing. It says, remember this and shew yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. For 12 weeks we have been studying this, but now I'm going to bring it to your mind again. Okay, here we go. We're summarizing the verses. It's not going to take very long at all. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1. In verse 1 and 2, all the heavens and the earth are told to hear the word and the teaching. The scripture says, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Does that make sense? We covered that. Give me verse 2. He says, my doctrine. What's another word for doctrine? Precepts. My teaching, instruction, law. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb. And as the showers upon the grass. Now, in verse 3 and 4, we're told the name of the Father, and we're introduced into the character of the Son. What's his character? He's the rock. Okay? So, God says, give me verse 3. He says, because I will publish the name of Yahweh, ascribe ye greatness unto our Yah. Give me verse 4. Now we get introduced to the rock. It says, he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. Uh, Allahayim of truth. And without iniquity, just and right is he. This right here is very important because this is supposed to be your character also. Remember, uh, the co-inhering, this concept means Christ is growing in you while you are growing in Christ. The more he grows in you, the more you're going to grow in him until you're going to be able to produce this character. You're going to be without iniquity. You're going to be just and you're going to be right. Okay. Now, when we get into verse five and six, we get introduced to the first crazy concept, the wheat and the tares. Right off the bat, we get introduced to the wheat and the tares. Um, the difference between Yah's children and those who look like his children but can't produce fruit. There's a whole lot of people running around like last night's message was about counterfeits. The counterfeit is seen clearly in the wheat and the tear because the wheat is able to produce fruit. The fruit that the tear produces is actually poison. So it is a counterfeit wheat. Give me verse five and six. It says, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Give me verse 6. It says, do ye thus requite Yahweh, O foolish people and unwise? What does the fool say? The fool says there is no God. They, okay, watch. Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? So we got introduced to the fact that there's going to be some counterfeits running around who are not purchased by the blood. You guys with me so far? In verses 7 through 9, we're told to remember the old ways and how when Yahweh divided the land, he gave the best land on the whole earth to who? His children. He gave the best land to Shem, which explains why we are not going off of the earth into outer space next to Pluto, hang a right at Uranus and end up in heaven somewhere in the sky. That's not going to happen. He gave the best land on the earth to his children. So where's heaven at? The kingdom of heaven is on the earth. That's what we find out in this next verse. It also explains why the other nations stole our land and kicked us out which explains why when we came out of the exodus he commanded us to take over that land because it is originally our land give me verse 7 the scripture says remember the days of old consider the years of many generations ask thy father and he will shew thee thy elders and they will tell thee verse 8 
when the most high divided to the nations their inheritance what's inheritance land when he separated the sons of adam he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of israel so children of israel got the best land and everybody else they got leftovers give me verse 9 this is the reason why go back to verse 9 it says for yahweh's portion is his people jacob is the lot of his inheritance okay now in verse 10 through 14 we learn how the most high loved he cared for and he protected jacob why because he's the apple of his eye you guys remember that right give me verse 10 watch this it says he found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness he led him about he instructed him he kept him as the apple of his eye give me verse 11 as an eagle stirreth up her nest fluttereth over her young spreadeth abroad her wings taketh them beareth them on her wings verse 12 so Yahweh alone did lead him and there was no strange God with him. Now this is how he cared for him and built him up. Give me verse 13. It says, he made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. He made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Verse 14. It says butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape at that time we were the highest we were the head and not the tail we were in the love in the favor under the protection of the most high but you know what we are the children of Israel are a disobedient rebellious stiff-necked people who refuse to hear the law so what happened next you guys tell me what happened next we got we we started trying to kick it we we waxed fat we started trying to kick it isn't that what usually happens after you set up you work real hard to get something and then after you got it you just take it for granted uh, and that's the reason why he says more no you need to be thankful for all things Watch. Now, verse 15 tells us that after Yahweh finds us and builds us up and he blesses Jacob, that Jacob starts tripping and stops being obedient and forgets about his relationship with the rock. Verse 15, it says, but just you run waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxing fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook Yah, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Isn't this making more sense now as you're reading through it? This, this is our last week going through the Song of Moses, but every picture should be crystal clear about who he is talking about now. There's no wonder. Oh, I wonder if he's talking about the ish people over there. He's not talking about the ish people. He's talking about this people. Now watch, verses 16 through 18, we see the provocation begins because Israel provokes the Most High by worshiping idols. And we think that those idols are other gods. They're not actually other gods. They're made of wood and stone and all of that stuff. Give me verse 16. It says, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. Verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to Yah, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Verse 18 is where it says, we forgot about him. It says, of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten Yah that formed thee. Now, in verse 19, we find out that Yah hates idols. Why does he hate the idols? Because the idols caused us to worship them. So if you're not reading this right, some people think that when, watch, you'll see it when we read verse 19, you'll think that he hates us. He can't hate us. We're his children. He hates the idols. Now watch, give me verse 19. It says, and when Yahweh saw it, he abhorred them. Who did he abhor? The idols. Did he abhor his children? No, the next line proves is that he didn't hate his children. It says he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Does that make sense? OK, 
Okay, and that's an example of rightly dividing the word. Because if you go too fast, you just read it with no punctuation. You're going to think that he hated his own children. Now, in verse 20, we see the first mention of the word faith in the whole Bible. And it is related to the children of Israel. And it says something specific about them. What is it? They don't have any faith. The very first time that this word is mentioned, it says, we don't have any. Give me verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. In verse 21, we see that he's going to use another nation of people to make us jealous because we used idols to make him jealous. Give me verse 21. He says, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not Yah. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Okay, I got one precept, my whole breakdown, only one, because most people struggle with this. Give me Romans chapter 11, verse 11, because most people are confused about how the ish people took over our heritage. The scripture says, I say then, have they, that's flesh and blood Israelites, have they stumbled that they should fall? What's the answer? Yah forbid. Yah forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto who? Another nation. Why? For to provoke them to jealousy. Now you see that precept lines up perfectly. Now we understand while other nations are able to have salvation, it's so that the children of Israel will be jealous. They get to have a part of your inheritance now. Take me back to that Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now in verse 22, we see that he's going to create the lake of fire on the earth and that those who refuse to be obedient will go into the lake. Who's the lake originally created for? The devil and his angels. Okay, but your angel, an angel is simply a messenger. So anybody who's out there who's spreading the message of hate, guess what? You're an angel of Satan. Yeah. Anybody who's out there spreading lies and blasphemies, they are the angel of the devil. Those who were out there preaching the law and the testimony, filling other people with light, demonstrating love, you are the children of the Most High. The children of the Most High are angels. They are messengers. Watch this. Give me verse oh, 22. It says, For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundation of the mountains. So far, we've seen a lot of the story, right? Everything is being built. Okay. Now, verses 23 through 25, we see that he's going to be against the children of Israel and is going to punish them for their disobedience. This is the first example of a dual prophecy. What does dual mean? Two. Two. Okay. That thing which hath been is that thing that shall be. It works that way within these prophecies. Just because a prophecy gets fulfilled once doesn't mean that it's not going to come back around. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about the tribulation, there's, there's a tribulation that happened during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and the Maccabees. Then there was a tribulation that happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed. But there is the great tribulation which is coming in our lifetime. And it's going to be worse than anyone that ever came before it. Okay, that is the day of our calamity. That is the time of Jacob's trouble. Watch this. This is him prophesying how he's going to punish us. Verse 23. He says, I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. Verse 24. They shall be burnt with hunger. Let's pause there for just a quick second. Do you remember what happened in 70 AD? The Romans came and they surrounded Jerusalem and they wouldn't let any food in and let no people out. So what did the people in Jerusalem have to do? They had to eat their children. They were starving to death. Huh? That's, Deuteronomy. That's in Deuteronomy. Now we see that thing is going to come back again. The same prophecy will be fulfilled because we're going to be starving because we don't take the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast only allows you to do one thing, buy or sell. That's it. 
That's all it does. It doesn't give you some magical power. But when my stomach is grumbling and you're eating and I'm not eating, I'm going to think that the ability to eat is like a magical power. I'm going to be so hungry that I'm going to be looking at some of these children like, you real fat right now. You look, you look, I got some, some hot sauce. Get them seasonings out. We're going to put some seasonings on these little kids. It, it's going to get that serious because that thing which hath been is that thing which shall be. We have to continue to trust in the most high and endure unto the end. Why? Because he that endures unto the end shall be saved. Now watch this. It says, they shall be burnt with hunger. And devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. Give me 25. He says the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin. The suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Now, when we get into verse 26, we see that he is going to throw us out of the land and scatter Israelites all over the world. And that other people won't remember who we are anymore. Give me verse 26. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Isn't it clear now? You be trying to tell your family members, bro, we the Israelites. We the people of the book. And they be like, nah, they don't understand it. They can't see it. They can't remember these things that we went through every single curse that is written in the Bible. And that he's still going to gather us. They can't see that part. Now, when we get into verses 27 through 30, he says that our enemies are going to take the credit for doing all of these things. And this is very important, this part. If they didn't take the credit for doing this, if they didn't say, I did this, if our enemies acknowledged that Yah did this, then it would be crystal clear who the children of Israel are. If our enemy said, it is not my power that I went there and I put these strong warriors on boats and brought them into slavery. If they said, Yah must have abandoned them and left them. That's how I was able to do it. Then they would figure out who the children of Yah are. But because they're so prideful and they say, I did this. Yah didn't do this. I did this out of my own power. He's going to punish them for that. Because they went above and beyond what he commanded them to do to us. Give me verse 27. He says, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely. And lest they should say, our hand is high and Yahweh hath not done all this. Give me verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Now, the them in that verse is who? No. That's, remember, guys, remember our, one of our brothers came to visit us and he was struggling with this part. He thought that just because it began to talk about our enemies in verse 27, that it was still talking about our enemies in verse 28. No. Who's the nation that's void of counsel? Israel is. Who's the nation in which there is no faith? Israel is that nation. Because we received the scriptures. The scriptures are our counselors. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. He's not talking about the other nations. He's talking about us. For we are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in us. If we understood these things, imagine the first time that you opened up the Bible and you read it. You said, oh, I understand who I am now. This whole awakening would have taken place years ago. We would already be in the kingdom. We have people reading this book for, look, I'm 50 years old. Matter of fact, my birthday is tomorrow. I'm going to be 51. I've been reading this Bible for the majority of my life. There's some people in this room older than me that have been reading it longer than me. And they did not understand that the whole book was talking about them. If you knew that the book was talking about you, you would start doing what the book says. You would stick to the script. Does that make sense? Why did we not? Because we are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. I want to encourage you guys. Don't just come here and listen to me read the Bible. You're going to learn, but you're going to learn way more when you go home and reread everything that I covered. If I cover it here, you go home and reread it. You go home and you share it with your children, share it with your loved ones. Because now you come here and you get the understanding, the explanation, the precepts. 
Okay, but you still have to wake up your family members that are sleeping. Amen. Amen. Give me verse 29. It says, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Oh, that the children of Israel understood this word right here. Oh, that they understood that the reason why they are uh, always in the ghetto, that they're always broke, that they're the last one to be hired and the first one to be fired. Oh, that they understood the curses so that they could figure out who they are. That they would consider their latter end. He wrote the end from the beginning. You guys remember what the, what the beginning is? What's the beginning? What's the beginning? No, what's that word in Hebrew? Yah-ah-sha-yath. Beginning. Okay, now watch this. Give me verse 30. It says, how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and Yahweh had shut them up? They got no business taking any credit for putting any of us in slavery. They got no business taking any credit for subduing the Native Americans and stealing their land. The Most High did all of those things. But these men in their pride say they did it and Yah didn't do it. If they would just acknowledge that he did it, they would know who we are. Now watch this. Verses 31 through 34, he goes back to the difference between the wheat and the tares, the children of the kingdom versus the children of the wicked, which are sown among his children. And he makes it very clear that only he knows the difference between the two. Give me verse 31. He says, for their rock, lowercase r, is not as our rock, uppercase r, even our enemies themselves being judges. Verse 32. Now he's talking about the tares. He says, for their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. From the lesson, let's think back. Pop quiz. Who remembers what Sodom and Gomorrah means in ancient Hebrew? Saddam and Gomorrah. Say again. Submersion and burning. It means lake of fire. Saddam and Gomorrah. Their vine is the vine of burning and the fields of submersion. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Keep going. Verse 33, he says, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. What's an asp? A snake. Okay, so he starts giving you some hints. There was a reason why Yahweh Shai called the scribes and the Pharisees a generation of vipers. Because a viper is a snake, and that snake kills you with the poison that comes out of its mouth. Give me verse 34. Now, watch. He says, is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? His treasure is this word. This word is forever settled in heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, there are two things, which is really one thing. What are those two things? Okay, Yahweh Shai is seated at the right hand of the Father. And what also is at the right hand of the Father? A book, a word. Because the angel says, go take the book out of the right hand of him that sitteth on the throne. Those two things are really one thing, and they are his treasure. And all of the things that we just covered were sealed in those treasures. We could have figured out who he was a long time ago if we wasn't so disobedient to reading the word. You guys ever heard this? If you want to hide something from a black person, where you hide it at? That's terrible. That's ter it's terrible, ain't it? You want to hide something from a black person, just put it in a book. I'm going to start going to some of y'all's houses now and just picking up books. Oh, $20 is in here. <laughs> right? <laughs> watch this. Okay, now watch. In verses 35 through 36, we learn that he's going to repay all of our enemies for everything that they've done unto us in their pride. And he gives us a hint at when he's going to do it and when he will begin to deliver us. Give me verse 35. He says, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. Verse 36. 
For Yahweh shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. When is he going to repent and, and have compassion on us again? When during the tribulation, when we have no power left, when our idols and our money and our gold and our silver and our own thoughts, when none of that stuff can save us is when we're going to cry out, oh, Yah, please help me. That's when we're going to seek him with our whole heart because we won't have anything left. That's when he will begin to deliver us. Okay, now in verses 37 through 38, we learn that he's going to mock us in our tribulation. And we're going to call because when we called on him, no, when he called on us, we mocked him. So now when we're in our distress and we call on to him, he's going to mock us because, you know, he has a sense of humor, right? He has a sense of humor. He thinks this is funny. Watch. Give me verse 37. He says, and he shall say, where are their gods? Their rock in whom they trusted. Verse 38. Which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See, he's mocking us now because you guys, you guys remember what mocking is? You guys remember what is it's, it's more than just making fun of. It's saying the same thing as somebody with a different uh, meaning behind it. So if I'm saying something and you repeat what I'm saying, but you're doing it uh, sarcastically, you're mocking me. That's what the children of Israel have been doing for hundreds of years with this word. We read this word and see what he says. And then we read it out of our own mouth and have a whole different intention. <laughs> Sarcastically. In verses 39 through 40, we see that he is the king forever. And whatever he says is exactly what is going to happen. Give me verse 39. He says, see now that I, even I am he and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Give me verse 40. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Right? Does that make sense? Everybody with me so far? We're summarizing this whole thing and we're at the end of it now. Now, verses 41 through 42, we see that the revenge begins and our enemies are punished. But Israelites are also punished along with them. If they continue to be disobedient, when the scripture says, come out from among her, be ye separated, free, flee out of Babylon. This is your last opportunity to be obedient to the scriptures, right? Because if you stay and he destroys this place, you will be destroyed along with it. The picture of that is Lot and his family. He's like, you better go. You got to go. You got to go and don't look back. So when it's time for you to go. You have to go and don't look back. Some people are going to be like, but I don't see no wars, no rumors of wars. And I don't see these things taking place. And I'm like, bro, we're already here in the mountains, setting up houses and growing sheep and fish. And we're living here now because very soon the mark is going to be implemented and enforced. If you wait to see it happen, it's going to be too late. But if you believe in faith and you start preparing now and you go, then you will be clear of the overthrow. Give me verse 41. It says, if I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and re will reward them that hate me. Give me verse 42. He says, I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Amen. Okay. In this final verse in the song of Moses, we see the fulfilling of the promise to Abraham. This story really kind of starts with Abraham, right? He, he told Abraham, get up from where you are, go to a place in faith. You never seen it. You just go. And then because Abraham was obedient, he made a promise to him. He, what was the promise? His name was Abram back then. And he changed his name to Abraham as a sign of the covenant that he made with them. And he said, I will make you the father of many nations. Now, here's part of where most of Israel is blind. They still think he's only going to be the father of one nation. 
those many nations are going to become one nation, Israel, but 12 tribes does not equal a nation. He's the father of many nations. So in this final verse, we see him fulfill his promise to Abraham by making him the father of many nations because people of other nations come with us into our land and they dwell with us in the kingdom. But at that point, they're not another nation. They are as one born in the land. Give me verse 43. It says, rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. Okay, so if they're rejoicing with us, where are they? With us. Because some Israelites will try to tell you that every other nation is going into the lake of fire. This just said that they're going to rejoice with us. Why? For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. His land has a name. His people have a name. Those two things have the same name. It's Israel. Does that make sense? Okay. And watch this. From the very beginning when he wrote, In the beginning, Yah made heaven, the heaven and the earth. Don't read no Bible that says heavens and earth. That's a counterfeit. In the beginning, Yah made the heaven and the earth. When he wrote that first line, he had already established a covenant. Because that same word that we covered for beginning is written there in the beginning. He already knew that he was going to make a covenant. That he was going to deliver all people who trust in his name. He already knew that Israel was going to get kicked out of their land, but that he was going to send his son as the final propitiation, as the perfect sacrifice to redeem us by his blood and bring us back into the covenant and back into the land. I have one last selection of scriptures from you proving that he knew the end from the very beginning. And if we just trust in his plan and stick to the script, we will be able to endure. Jeremiah chapter 29, give me verse 10. Watch this. He says, for thus saith Yahweh, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. Okay. I got to pause right there because when he says 70 years, he doesn't mean 70 actual years. What does he mean? 70 groups of seven. He means 70 times seven. And this mystery is broken down in Daniel. The 70 weeks of Daniel represents all time. So he's not going to come and visit us in the middle of that time. And Daniel figured that out because Daniel was over 70 years old. And he's like, wait a minute, we've been in Babylon for over 70 years. I better pray and figure out what was written in the book of Jeremiah because the most high's word cannot fail. And he began to fast and he began to pray and an angel was sent unto him and he explained to him, it's not 70 literal years. It's 70 groups of seven years. It's all all the time that is left in the world from that time forward. So watch, it says, Thus saith Yahweh that after 70 years, 70 weeks of years, be accomplished at Babylon. We're still in Babylon now, aren't we? Babylon, America. I will visit you. Okay, he's going to come. And perform my good word towards you. What did his good word say? No matter where you are in the world, I will gather you from that place and bring you into the land of Israel. He says, in causing you to return to this place. Okay, give me the next verse, verse 11. Everybody knows this verse, but some people, they say the same, they say the wrong words. They say, for I know the plans. Anybody ever heard that before? That's not what the Bible says. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I know the thoughts that he thinks towards me too. Did you guys know that when you open up the scriptures, it's like reading the mind of Yah? You're, you get to read his mind. You don't, you don't have to, some people, they still try to interpret or misinterpret his mind. But if you say, I'm just going to do exactly what he said. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. If he said that he meant that he's going to do that. So I'm going to do that also. Now I'm reading his mind and I'm able to understand it. Okay. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith Yahweh, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you. An expected end. What's the end? That the highest authority will come and consume you and make a covenant with you. That's the end. Now watch. Give me verse 12. 
Now, once he makes that covenant with us, watch this. It says, then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Give me verse 13. He says, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Verse 14 is my last verse. It says, and I will be found of you, saith Yahweh, and I will turn away your captivity. What does that mean? We still captives? Nope, we're not captives. He says he's going to turn away our captivity. What's else he going to do? And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith Yahweh. And here's that final fulfillment. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captives. The whole story is outlined multiple times throughout the scriptures. All we have to do is trust and believe and stick to the script. Amen. This is the message that I have for you today. Hallelujah.